We join Constellation in Amsterdam, and after a full day sailing round Denmark, we berth in Warnemunde, North Germany, for a long full day trip to Berlin. Our first stop is Charlottenburg Palace, the largest surviving palace in Berlin, dating from the end of the 17th century. We cross into the former East Berlin to visit the longest preserved stretch of the Berlin Wall, known as the East Side Gallery. At this point, the River Spree formed the actual border. Brand new sports stadium right across the road. The television tower was a landmark of East Berlin and is visible from many points around the city. Checkpoint Charlie has been reinstated as a tourist attraction. The outline of the wall is marked in the ground here. Before the Second World War, the area around Potsdam Platz was the vibrant heart of the city, but during the East German time, it was more or less a wasteland. This is claimed to be the oldest traffic light in the world. Since reunification, vast sums of money have been spent on the Potsdamer Platz area. This is the Sony Center. We had a German lunch here, and also some German beer. They've preserved part of the interior of an old hotel. Berlin's Holocaust Memorial consists of 2,711 concrete slabs or stelae. Its architect has never explained what precisely these mean. Our first sight of the Reichstag as we round the corner towards the Brandenburg Gate. We're in the former East Berlin in Parisierplatz, looking towards the west. There's the US Embassy. Looking east down the Unterdain Linden, you can't get away from the old East German television tower. At the far end of Unterdain Linden, this former Imperial Guardhouse now contains the memorial to the victims of war and tyranny. This area once contained the main Imperial palaces and was significantly restored by the East German government after the Second World War. Back to West Berlin now, and the government area on the other side of the Brandenburg Gate. These offices are occupied by members of the German Parliament. The Federal Chancery is popularly known as the washing machine. The Reichstag had lain derelict since the fire in the 1930s but it's now been restored by Sir Norman Foster to be the Parliament of the reunited Germany. It's late evening when we get back to the ship, then a full day at sea and we arrive in Stockholm. The shuttle bus drops us near the Opera House.
the Swedish Parliament building and just across the canal the Royal Palace they can keep an eye on each other the main entrance to the palace is on the other side of the building and this is where lots of tourists come to watch the changing of the guard Next to the palace is Storkirkan, the cathedral. The Baroque interior of Stockholm's German church. The Ridderhuset or House of the Nobility, Ridderholm's Church where Swedish monarchs are buried. Some much more modern architecture. And back to the rear of the Parliament building. It's an overnight hop to Helsinki, Finland. We got the shuttle bus into town and then made our own way to the Rock Church. Completed in 1969, the main body of the church is excavated from the living rock. The dome is made from copper wire. Next stop, the Finnish Parliament building, opened in 1931. By the time we get down to the main harbour area, the rain has set in pretty relentlessly. There's time for a visit to one of Joe's favourite designer shops. Aniki Karvinen. It's a wet trudge back to the shuttle bus to get back on board and into the dry. Another overnight sail brings us to St. Petersburg. The new cruise terminal, built on reclaimed land on the Gulf of Finland, is large enough to accommodate several large modern cruise ships. We're on a private two-day tour, arranged through Cruise Critic by Brandy with Alla Tours. In less than half an hour, we're in central St. Petersburg, starting at the Rostral Columns. From this point, there are good views across the main channel of the Neva River to some of St. Petersburg's most famous sites, including the Winter Palace and the Hermitage Museum. The old Stock Exchange building is now a naval museum. Next, Julia takes us for a ride on the St. Petersburg Metro, starting at Sportivnaya Station. You buy tokens to go through the turnstiles, one token per trip. The system is very deep underground, because of the marshy ground above. Yeah, 
Next, it's a river and canal cruise, starting near the Hermitage. That's St. Peter and Paul's Church, where we'll be going later. The cruiser Aurora, whose gunshot signalled the start of the October Revolution in 1917. The old Leningrad Hotel dates from the Cold War, now renamed St. Petersburg Hotel. The Church on the Spilled Blood is on the site of the assassination of Tsar Alexander II in 1881. This is the actual spot where the bomb was thrown at him. The building was very badly damaged during the Soviet era, but has recently been massively restored and is now officially the Russian Museum of Icons. The Church of St. Peter and Paul in the fortress of Peter and Paul, on the site of the original settlement of St. Petersburg just over 300 years ago. It's the burial site of the Romanov Tsars. The bodies of the last Tsar, Nicholas II, and his family have been reinterred here. Then it's a hydrofoil ride to Peterhof, the palace started by Peter the Great as his answer to Versailles. This is Mont Plaisir, the original building of the palace. The fountains are fed by natural water pressure. Peterhof was occupied by the Germans during the Second World War and they left it ruined, but recently restoration has been completed. Back on the bus to Sarskoi Selo, the Sars village in the modern suburb of Pushkin, another vast estate built by the Romanovs for their own pleasure. Catherine's palace belonged to Catherine I, the wife of Peter the Great. It was greatly extended by her daughter, the Empress Elizabeth. It was mainly a palace for entertaining in and showing off in, rather than being a principal residence of the royal family. This palace was also occupied by the Germans during World War II, and they left it also pretty ruinous. Almost everything that we can see has been painstakingly reconstructed.
The famous Amber Room has been reconstructed, but we're not allowed to photograph or video in there. Time to head back to the ship for an evening at the ballet and another early start in the morning. We meet Julia outside the terminal and the main item on the agenda for the morning is the Hermitage Museum, starting in the old Winter Palace State Apartments. The Hermitage Museum consists of five buildings, the largest of which is the Winter Palace once the centre of Tsarist power, but towards the end of the Tsarist period, mainly used for ceremonial purposes. This is the room of the field marshals. This is the small throne room. The armorial hall was one of the principal reception rooms for state events. The courtyard garden seen through the windows. The military gallery contains portraits of every general who took part in the war against Napoleon in 1812, all painted from the life. This is the Tsar Alexander I, and this is Prince Mikhail Kutuzov, the head of the Russian armies. St. George's Hall was the main throne room of the palace. The peacock clock is over 200 years old and still works. We're moving now from the Winter Palace to the Hermitage itself. We only have time to see a small part of the huge collection. There are two paintings of the Madonna and Child by Leonardo da Vinci, a useful one and one he painted later in life. The lobby of the Hermitage Theatre, where we saw the ballet the previous night. The view from the bridge linking two of the Hermitage buildings across a canal. A reproduction of Raphael's Vatican Legiers. Unfinished statue of a crouching boy by Michelangelo. Canova made two versions of the Three Graces, this is the first. The main entrance to the Hermitage hasn't been used since 1941. This is what it looks like from the outside.
Palace Square is St. Petersburg's largest public square. The Alexander Column commemorates the victory over Napoleon's armies in 1812. The face of the angel on top of the column resembles Alexander I. St. Isaac's Cathedral, where we will be going later. The General Staff Building, where our restaurant for lunch is. After lunch, it's the Yasupov Palace. We didn't get a video permit, so Jo sneaked these videos on her camera. The Yasupovs were said to be the wealthiest family in Russia, possibly even more wealthy than the Romanovs themselves. The last Yusupov to live here led the conspiracy to murder Rasputin. We were treated to a brief a cappella concert by this Russian group, and this is their music that's playing now. The palace includes this magnificent private theatre. Then it's off to visit St. Isaac's Cathedral. On the opposite side of the square is the Legislative Assembly building. The statue is of Peter the Great. The church was completed in 1858 in the neoclassical style and is in the form of a symmetrical Greek cross. The church was turned into a museum by the Soviet government, but has since been restored and is now a church again. The church is certainly one of the largest cathedrals in the world. The dome rises 333 feet above ground level. Our two days in St. Petersburg are at an end, and there's a band waiting to greet us by the ship. An overnight sail brings us back down the Gulf of Finland to Tallinn, capital of Estonia. The old town is quite compact and an easy walk from the cruise terminal. Our walking route from the ship takes us through a tourist market. Tallinn was virtually destroyed during the Second World War, being bombed both by the Allies and the Germans. Virtually everything we see is a post-war reconstruction.
The Church of the Holy Spirit dates from the 14th century and is apparently the only church in Tallinn still in its original form. This is a memorial to a Royal Naval action during the Estonian War of Independence at the end of the First World War when the Navy prevented Estonia from falling to the Soviet Army. That's the Tower of the Town Hall. The Town Hall Square is busy with cafes and restaurants and we stopped here for our mid-morning refreshment. Climbing to the upper town, this is the Russian Orthodox Cathedral. The Estonian Parliament Building. The Lutheran Cathedral. We finally reach the viewpoint over the lower town. St. Nicholas Church is now a museum and concert hall. looking now through one of the old town gates. Walking along the old city walls on our way back. Time for a little more souvenir browsing before we get back on board. A full day at sea brings us to a very rainy Copenhagen. When the rain eventually eases off for a bit, we decide just to go for a short stroll along the waterfront. The famous statue of Hans Andersen's Little Mermaid, recently returned from a visit to Shanghai. Copenhagen's modern opera house was donated to the Danish people by the family that owns the Maersk shipping line. So it's a damp trudge back to the ship for us. Another day at sea and then we'll disembark in Amsterdam. But before that there is the inevitable chef's parade. <laughs> Croatia! <laughs> 